Welcome back to the Breakfast Leadership Show, specifically the best of Breakfast Leadership Show. I'm often asked by new listeners or by guests that want to catch up on some of my shows to say, you know, do I have an episode that they would want to listen to that I would recommend to them? When you've interviewed over 600 people, um, that can get a little difficult. It really depends on what you're looking for. Are you looking for Harvard professors or Harvard Business Review people or authors or astronauts or people that are in the arts or business leaders, owners, millionaires, billionaires? What are you looking for? Uh, but time and time again, uh, and this one, and again, I've I've enjoyed every interview. I've learned from everyone that I've ever talked to, which is an amazing, I, I, quite frankly, it's an amazing gig uh, to be able to talk with some of the people that I've been able to speak with over the years. But there's always one episode that seems to come to the top again and again. And it's the interview with Maestro Roger Nirenberg. Uh, Roger was uh, the former conductor of New York Philharmonic Orchestra. And now he's a leadership consultant. And without spoiling the interview, uh, I was amazed. And he actually wrote a book about this as well, which would be in the show notes and all of that. Uh, but this interview is really good because of what he does when he's working with teams. And it it caught my eye and my ear when I was listening to it. And I was always really thankful about the experience because it shed light on just how leadership and the perception of it and the viewpoint of where you are in an organization is dramatically different from your vantage point. Again, I don't want to spoil it anymore. So enjoy the episode. And again, thank you for listening. This is the Breakfast Leadership Podcast. Boundaries or burnout, you make the choice. Here's your host, Michael Levitt. Welcome to the Breakfast Leadership Podcast. Today, I have a really incredible individual, Maestro Roger Nirenberg. He's the founder of the Music Paradigm. He's a conductor, and he leads his organization to work with incredible organizations that you've heard of and know of. Maestro, welcome to the show. Delighted to be here, Michael. So enlighten us on how you made the transformation from being a conductor of orchestras to a leadership consultant transforming organizations all across the globe? Well, it, it actually, the starting point was that I was, I was pondering how you can expand the audience for classical music because I saw that the principal problem that we have in classical music is there's not sufficient audience. There aren't enough people who really, who crave it and who love it and want, it, want live music in, in their lives. So that was what I was searching. And, and the starting point was, is there a way to take somebody who's, who's an intelligent person, curious and, uh, and well-educated, but doesn't really feel symphonic music? Is there a way to, to give that person uh, an experience that makes it come alive for them? That was what I was trying to do. And along the way, I invented this this kind of experiential learning that's called the music paradigm. And it was a kind of an accident. Some of the greatest things in the history of the human race were discovered by accident. Uh, and this was an amazing discovery. And uh, I don't want to necessarily say it was an accident, but it definitely has transformed organization as well. One of the things that jumped out of me, you know, when reading your book, as well as just researching you and, and learning more about you is the concept of listening. And one of the things that I think a lot of leaders today and, and probably for a long time have struggled with was to truly listen. And could you enlighten us a little bit more on, on, on your concept of listening and, and how it makes such a big difference, both from a conductor standpoint and then also in a leadership world? Well, listening is something which is uh, essential to musicians. You know, musicians have to train themselves to be able to, while doing many other things, to, to listen to themselves and to listen to others. And it's not just with, with curiosity, but it's active. And it involves a lot of mind reading. 
it involves hearing what the intent is behind the sound and then predicting based on what you're hearing what the next thing is going to be and kind of always anticipating and preparing. And musicians tend, tend to listen that way in music, but it has a great deal of power when, when anybody takes it on. We are trained so much to, to uh, speak and to write, and uh, we focus on the output. And there's not as much training on how to really take in what's going on, listen to people and to hear them. And uh, what I discovered through my conducting, but then also through the work with the music paradigm, is that it's very transformative. When you listen openly and with curiosity, it has a transforming effect. It has a transforming effect on those to whom you're listening. And it makes, when you listen well, it, it inspires other people to listen as well. That's a great analogy. And one of the things that I noticed in, because when I you know, first started looking into this, I, it amazed me the synergies between an orchestra and a team, because if that orchestra is one note off, unless you are a complete novice and you, you haven't ever listened to classical music or any type of music in your life, you will notice it. And just like in operations and organizations, if something is off or you have a team or a division that's off, it impacts the entire organization. And I, I love how you synergize those things. One of the things that jumped out at me too is just, again, watching you know some of the videos, and I encourage uh, the listeners to, to do a lot of research, and I'll have it in the show notes as well. But the reaction of you know the people that you were coaching in, in these sessions, what are some stories that you can share with the audience today about some of the, I don't know, aha moments or potentially things that really surprised you when you first started working with, with different teams uh, on, on the leadership training that you provide? Well, people are not used to receiving learning through an artistic experience. And what I mean by artistic is that it's, a, it's kind of a pretend world that you enter into when you sit inside an orchestra the way I ask the participants in my sessions to do. And at first, you, you're just kind of idly listening to the sounds. But the deeper I take them in on my kind of tour of the orchestra, the more they begin to understand that the behaviors that are going on in the orchestra are, are basically the same behaviors that are going on in their organization, meaning that people are interdependent, they collaborate, they work on aligning, they work on uh, adjusting, tuning, all those kinds of things. But you hear it so much clearer in music, especially when you have a demonstration of, of a sort of dysfunctional behavior, and then you fix it up by correcting what the musicians are doing. Uh, and then they hear the difference between what it's like when people are actually really listening well and when they're not, or when they're aligning well as opposed to when they're thinking about themselves primarily. And there's this fascination that people have because they're hearing, they're hearing it as if for the first time. And because it's so spontaneous and so real, people get really fascinated. And what they're not anticipating is that they'll begin to see themselves in this. Because the whole design of the music paradigm is to use the music as a kind of a mirror through which people can see themselves. But they see themselves because it's a metaphor and because it's a sort of a fairy tale, they see themselves much more clearly. You've worked with a ton of famous corporations and organizations, Microsoft, Johnson & Johnson, Kraft, and all of that. But one organization that you recently worked with jumped out at me quite a bit, and it was the Dallas Mavericks of the NBA. You would listed in your blog that you were, you know, this is something that you've wanted to do ever since you launched your organization was to work with a professional sports team. Tell us a little bit about that experience because I'm wondering what the synergies would be uh, in comparing to the corporate world that you've uh, been working with for a long time, what it was like to work with, with the Mavericks organization. Well, I begin by, by saying that people don't understand that 
the music paradigm, the work that I do, is always customized for every organization. It's not as if I have some kind of routine. And the starting point is when I talk with the, the people who have engaged me and I ask, what is this meeting about? What, what are you trying to accomplish? What's, what's your success picture? And, and then I ask, well, what are the challenges that are standing in the way? What are the, what's the mindset and the behavior that you'd like to reinforce? And what is it that you'd like, to, you'd like to try to get people to stop doing and become aware of themselves? And then I use the, the orchestra in order to, to grow those behaviors spontaneously right in front of them with an orchestra that, that isn't prepared for this. All they, they're prepared for is how they're going to play the music, but we do kinds of role plays. So I always customize it for each organization. In the case of the Mavericks, this was an organization that's just that's in the middle of a very important change because they had a very public kind of embarrassment in some dysfunction uh, of diversity and uh, gender bias in their organization. And it was very public and a new team was brought in to transform their culture. And so when I worked with them, now, unfortunately, I wasn't working with the players. I was working with the business side, the people who, who do the marketing and do the community relations and, and sell the tickets and, and run, run the institution in many ways. But uh, it was still fascinating because the commonality of the kinds of issues that deal, they deal with are not so different from other organizations as well. Yeah, that was very public, some of the challenges that that organization faced, and um, it it speaks volumes that uh, they brought you in to help um, right the ship and and correct some behaviors. I anticipate that there would be a lot more organizations, because we've heard about it in the news over the last year and and, and a bit, that, uh, that have not been behaving in the best fashion. And I think your, your training and your leadership uh, really bodes well for organizations to really get in unison about how they're doing. Because I find, again, in my experience and in, in working with other organizations is there's so many silos when it comes to things. And that that's not going to bode well for any organization if you're operating in an individual standpoint. Each each musician and each note is important for the overall flow of you know the performance and in organizations, you know, every time we, we open up the doors, it is a performance. We're performing for our customers, our clients. If you're in healthcare, your patients. And it makes a lot of sense to have those things in, in sync for sure. What's, I guess, one of the great things about the show is I, I always ask people about, you know, boundaries and burnout. And I, I'd love to hear your perspective on um, how, classical music and then the work that you do with, with the music paradigm can help organizations mitigate and reduce any type of burnout or stress amongst their organizations? Well, burnout is a common thing in, in industries that are under stress. You know, in healthcare, for example, which is undergoing so many changes, so many changes in the, which, in the way in which money is allocated and and there's so much stress because people are being whipped around each time it changes. It, by the time the change comes to them, it becomes a, becomes a major uh, adjustment. And, um, and people get discouraged. They get used to one thing and then they have to redo it. And they begin to feel as though their contribution doesn't matter that much, that they could just be replaced by anybody or re- be replaced by some kind of robot and it would be the same and that's a very demoralizing thing so all of that really speaks to the problem of how difficult it is for people inside an organization to see the big picture this is one of the exercises that i always do in each session i i bring a couple of people to from their chairs sitting amongst the orchestra they come and they they stand on the podium right next to me and then they hear what it is that the conductor hears, and they remark about how different it is, how, uh, how by comparison, what they heard from their chair, while it was compelling, it's not nearly so fascinating and not so engaging as what they hear on the podium. 
And that's a metaphor for the way it is in organizations, that organizations by their very nature are full of blind spots. And when you sit in an organization for a long time, you get so used to it that you don't realize that, that you're living in a blind spot. And so what, what this means is that the leader's job in large part is just to, to shed light on what people can't see, and especially the thing that's so obvious when you're a leader, which is the purpose of your organization and, and the, what it does for the people that you serve and uh, your, your customers, your clients, your patients, whatever it is, that you have a much clearer idea about how much benefit there is. But for the people who are working, doing the day-to-day -day work, they can get very abstracted from that. And so um, burnout is uh, eased when people are connected to how much good they do for other people. And there are all kinds of demonstrations in which I dramatize this in the orchestra. What's it like when people are just task-focused as opposed to when they're focused on the listener and moving the listener and changing the listener's life? And they hear the orchestra instantly. They hear it, they hear it energized. They hear it inspired. Everybody can hear that. And what they're thinking is, well, how do we do that? How would, how would we make that so clear to our people? And what would it be like if we acted out of the same kind of energy and inspiration as we heard the orchestra do the second time? That is leadership gold. And when organizations have a desire to make their organizations sound like a classic orchestra, it is transforming for the leadership, for the employees, the people that work for them, and the clients and customers that they serve and the impact that they have on, on society as a whole. It's amazing, yeah. amazing work. I couldn't agree with you more, but if I were listening to you saying that, I, was, I, would, I wouldn't believe it. I, I, I would say, well, that's just, that's just fairy tale stuff. You know, the fact is that listening to an orchestra is complex. That's part of what makes it so great. And a lot of people, they get lost in the complexity. They can't find their way. But that's exactly what I address in my sessions. I make it so that I enter the inquiry in a way that people have an easy time hearing what's going on and hearing differences. And as they begin to hear, they gain their confidence in being able to observe it. And finally, they do reach a point where they're seeing the commonality between what's happening in the orchestra in, and, and their own professional lives. And that's when the light bulb goes off. And that's when you see the, the expressions that you, you were talking about earlier on people's faces, this moment of enlightenment. Where they, suddenly they understand what's going on around them with a new kind of clarity. And they, they also understand their own behavior. And oddly enough, they understand their own power and their ability to affect their own lives. So I think that's why this, it's such a positive atmosphere in the room. There's so much laughter. There, there's so much good spirits. And, and there's such appreciation for beauty as well. Yeah, and that's, I think we all long for that as, as, as people going through life, just to have those connections and enlightenment, to be able to experience something special. And when we have that in our personal lives and our work lives, uh, it's, it makes such a huge difference in how we go about our days. And it makes for, as you said, you know, the, the reduced burnout and because uh, we feel like we're, you know, making a contribution, you know, we are doing something good for others. And I think when we are operating in that space, it makes a huge difference in everything that we do. There's another difference between the music paradigm and other kind of more traditional leadership training or leadership learning, or for that matter, teamwork learning and coll collaborative learning. In most, most learning, you have somebody up at the front of the room who, who is wise, who's thought about things a lot, who knows more, and then informs the people in the audience uh, of what that person has learned. 
that doesn't happen in the music paradigm. In the music paradigm, I never say what it is that we're learning about. I never identify what the wisdom is, but rather I set up the room in such a way that we run a kind of experiment and everybody reaches their own conclusions. Nobody's telling them what it means. And because the learning is discovered by each person individually, that's the kind of leader of learning that they take ownership of because nobody gave it to them. They found it themselves. It's amazing, amazing stuff, Maestro. I really appreciate our conversation today and I uh, love the, the leadership insights and everything that you talked about today. Uh, how can our audience find out more about you and the music paradigm? Well, I think primarily you go to our website, which is musicparadigm.com. And there are, there are videos there. There are blogs that, that I've taken great pain to try to make clear and, and uh, understandable and, and uh, with simple but powerful lessons. And um, there are photos. There are, there are a number of things. And, and more and more, I, I'm always producing videos and also um, – and a lot of the videos go into blogs, videos and uh, other kinds of devices for people to, to share the understanding that I've recently come by. That's great. And the audience, I'll definitely have all of that information in the show notes on the episode. So again, Maestro, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you and all that you're doing for for all of us uh, and, and making uh, the, the music that we hear um, even better uh, in our work lives and, and our home lives as well. So thank you again for being on the show. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And until next time, everyone, be well. Hey, it's Michael again. Thank you for listening to the podcast. I really appreciate it. If you're like many people, you're dealing with some significant stress and possibly approaching burnout. I know how you feel. In 2009, my burnout led to a year of worst case scenarios. I do not want that to happen to you. If you go to breakfastleadership.com, you can register for a free webinar on burnout prevention, as well as get as a free checklist to have successful mornings. Start off each day the right way. Again, that's at breakfastleadership.com. Also, since you are a loyal podcast listener, I'm asking you to like, rate, and review my podcast on iTunes. I look at all the reviews and appreciate your comments, and it helps other potential listeners discover the content I have on the show. I appreciate you, and thanks again for listening.